All right, on this episode of Bouts Talking Bouts, very excited to be chatting with an individual ahead of Ryzen 45 and the continuation of that awesome New Year's Eve tradition in Japan for combat sports and very excited to talk a bit about the event with Ryzen play-by-play commentator Joe Ferraro. How's it going there, man? Good, what's going on? Everything is going great. Hope everything's good on your end. Yeah, no, doing well, man, and just love this time of year. I mean, the holidays obviously are fun and everything, but I mean, the classic, like, holiday event for combat sports fans and whatnot, the New Year's Eve event, and definitely a lot to talk about with that, but figured I'd be remiss if I didn't touch on at least, like, the last Rising card, at least in a cursory kind of way. It just seemed like a big moment with it being that first international card in Azerbaijan. So, like, what were your thoughts on that whole event and as far as, like, how it was received and came across as, like, that first kind of international foray for Ryzen? Yeah, good on the promotion for taking it international. I thought it was an absolutely fantastic event. Uh, a lot of fun to call for Damien and I. Uh, to say the least, the, the belts were kind of up and down and surprising. And uh, obviously there were some upsets, but, you know, I, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. It's wonderful if they continue to do that. Uh, although I do know, obviously, that Japan is the home base and that's where a lot of the fan base is. But I'm so happy for them that, you know, they were able to travel abroad and have a really good job, you know, showing and following at the event. So it was so much fun. Yeah, I love to see it. I think it shows that Ryzen's in a very good place in a lot of regards. And, I mean, just what a event we have here. I mean, I love checking out the New Year's Eve events. Obviously, Pride was great with that for many years. But Ryzen has definitely had quite a few memorable events as well. And, I mean, this Juan Archuleta headlining fight definitely, you know, fits comfortably within that facing, you know, Kai Asakura with that Bantamweight belt being defended by the former against the latter. Like, what are your thoughts on that main event fight? Because it seems like a lot of people are really looking at it as, like, a massive Bantamweight fight on a global scale and everything. Oh, I think it's absolutely huge. I think it's absolutely fantastic because you've got that experience of, you know, Juan Archuleta, he's got over 30 fights, but, you know, many people don't know Kai Sakura, this, this, I think this will be his 25th fight. So he's got experience as well. He's very explosive. Uh, you know, Juan's a methodical fighter, right? Like Archuleta, when he fights, he'll decide if he's striking. He'll decide if it's going to go down to the ground, whereas Kai Sakura just brings it. They're, uh, you know, the Asakura brothers are great, fantastic knock- knockout artists, but they're very patient. They'll, they'll wait for their opportunity, but the moment, and I mean the moment they smell blood, they go in for the kill. Right, so I think it's going to be one of those fights that could start off slow, kind of build up, and then the, the moment there's going to be some sort of action, it will go from level zero, level one to level ten real quick. Absolutely, and the co-main event very interesting in its own right too, with Kyoji Horiguchi and Makoto Shinryu rematching for that vacant flyweight crown a bit of an inauspicious way the first fight ended like I guess to that point like do you see maybe the first fight at all like informing this second fight to any kind of degree like do you think maybe they will have maybe that additional level of urgency or maybe that first fight is kind of inconsequential as far as how it'll inform this sequel and maybe this next fight is like the better representation of what this matchup looks like if that makes sense uh, no, it's, it's, it's a valid point. It's a hundred percent a valid point. I think the, the you know the previous boat, you know, whether well, it was you know it's an accident light poke, obviously it was so quick. Um, it's it's not really going to have too much per se, but it just means both fighters have done their homework or a lot more homework, right, uh, on each other. So it'll really define exactly you know what may have happened, uh, you know, back in July, or what could have happened, excuse me, in July. Uh, but then again, a fight's a fight. Anything can happen, right? Things change. You know, one punch, one knee, one elbow. Uh, one kick, anything can happen. A guy, you know, a fighter can roll their ankle. Uh, we don't know about it. You know, you know who was really a hundred percent heading into that first fight. Who's going to be a hundred percent heading into this fight? So it's difficult to say how it's going to play out. But you know, a lot of the questions that I've been dealing with have been, you know, is, is Horiguchi? Is, are we beginning to see the, you know, the father time now affecting Horiguchi? Is this the, the beginning of the end of his career? I'm like, well, he's he's sort of coming off of two straight wins. I know he's two and two in his last four fights. Uh, but you can make the argument he's three and two, right? So it's it's one of those things where you know is this the beginning of the end for Horiguchi? Does he still have it? Whereas Shiryu is just like on fire, right? So it's it's a wonderful matchup to say hey, Kyogi, you know, Horiguchi is still the man at this division, uh, at least in Japan. And then you know is is this changing of the guard, a passing of the torch, right? So the storylines heading into this fight are absolutely fantastic. It's again, it's another one of these fights that I can't wait to call and just. Referee, please step out of the way. Let's let's just call this fight. Let's go. And I love that you used that word. It's very much on the wavelength that 
I'm on with everything because like I feel like in Japanese mixed martial arts there's a great sense of like telling a story for like the immediate event but also I guess having tendrils that can inform like a subsequent event thereafter and I feel like that John Dodson versus Hiromasa Ogi Kubo fight fits very well within that in a certain sense just in as far as how it could inform like a subsequent title contender for a future event so love to see it well that's the thing I mean the, the, the one beauty about Japanese MMA especially Rise in MMA is their storylines right like there's 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 specific there's reasons for fights most of the time right like, I mean for the vast majority of time there's there, there's a reason why the bout is being put together because there's a story being told but also the winner of the bout will get something bigger in return, right? But, again, the person who doesn't win, you know, you know, they're looked at, hey, did you put on a great performance? Good, we're going to still keep you in the loop, right? That's the beauty of, of, of Rise in MMA and just Japanese MMA in general. It's not just the, the, the win or loss or draw. It's the actual performance, right? But this one has huge, huge, you know, implications for the division. I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, you know, Dotson's what? He's, I think he's 6-0 in his last six fights. Right, uh, he's doing absolutely fantastic, and of course, you look at Kubo. That that guy there is just a, a wrestling machine, right? It doesn't matter where the fight goes, he's going to control his opponent. It is what it is. Unfortunately, um, you know, he's he's coming off three straight losses, right? And then the draw, of course, with the uh, issue Atari. So uh, a bit of a challenge for him. But this is a guy that's defeated Asakura in a way. Like he's no joke, right? So, and, but the running joke that Danny and Brown, my my play, play you know, my color commentator, have all the time is when Oki Kubo fights. We're sitting down for 50 minutes, right? It's going to be a long, drawn-out mall and brawl, uh, you know, mall and sprawl, and just take the guy down and just dominate him. But whatever, every time we say that, you never know. The guy pulls off a crazy win, right? So it's going to be fantastic. But Dawson's a difficult guy to finish, right? you got to be careful with him. He's just so explosive. I remember seeing him at the Ultimate Fighter uh, the very first time when they were doing the trials for the Ultimate Fighter. And we just kept looking over going, who is this guy? Just jumping, you know, six feet in the air with flying knees. So... His explosiveness can, can end a fight very, very quick, whereas Okikubo is just methodical, patient, grab you, take you down, control you, uh, and, and, and you know, ground and pound see if you can pull off the finish. So another fantastic fight, to say the least. Yeah, I mean, just match up so well with each other, for sure, and I think it's a very you know relevant fight as a title eliminator, just like the momentum Dodson has, and just Okikubo's resume, as you alluded to, and having previously contended for Rise and Gold. So, I mean, I think that would make sense if that was positioned in that kind of way. But, I mean, just speaking to, like, you know, former champions and prevalent figures on the card, like, I feel like the, I guess, story of Clever Koike is fascinating heading into this event because it's a similar thing to kind of what we were talking about before where it's like, yeah, you know, over, like, the last few fights, like two losses, bookending a no contest. It's like one would think like, oh yeah, I got to, you know, get back in the win column in a sense. But I mean, the quality of his performances really, you know, do stand out. So an interesting fight for Clever Koike as he tries to get back on track at this huge New Year's event as well. And I guess get back to like that title contention once again. Yeah, it's a weird fall from grace for Clever, right? Like he was doing so fantastic, fantastic, you know, when he... You know, he wins by a triangle choke versus Ushiku, and it was just one of those things where it's like, man, this guy cannot be stopped. This, this thing, if it gets down to the ground, it's over. Uh, and then P Pitbull proved otherwise, right? And then the whole no contest with Suzuki, that, that one ended in less than three minutes, right? And then Kanahara kind of just kind of laid out a book to say, you know what? Maybe you can't submit people all the time when you're on the ground. And Kanahara did a great job um, at just taking that fight, going the distance, uh, staying away from any sort of damage, being confident really pushing clever to a point of man what do i do i really need to take my striking to the next level what he has right he's been training non-stop uh improving his, his side up game but when you take a look at clever i still think he's extremely dangerous if he gets this fight down on the ground it can get really really ugly um you know for for saito but saito's been around like that guy there can just stand and bang with the best of them he's very you know technically difficult to finish Right, I mean that that split decision against Red Hinamoto. I think he was going to do much. He was expecting to do much better in that fight. He did do good, right? But you know, rebounding off of those three straight losses against you know Ushiko Asakura and again Ushiko. But I think he's ready to rock and roll here. In my opinion, if he stays away from Clever, keeps his distance, stays on his bike, you know, sticks and moves, gets in there, he should be able to pull off the victory. The problem is, is if Clever gets him down on the ground, we still feel like there's a stopwatch that we click, and it's going to be over very very quickly again. Remains to be seen. The fight's a fight, but another one of those boats that are just like, Dylan, oh man, like, don't blink here. Do not blink. 
Yeah, for sure. And one of the great fights, I mean, I think this fight, I was talking to Sakaki Bara about this the other day, just how Ryzen has like this unique confluence of like simultaneously kind of like tipping the cap to like older fans of like the Japanese scene from back in the day, but also very forward thinking in a lot of regards. And I think that's captured in a big way in that Saika Izawa versus Miyu Yamamoto matchup. I mean, I'm sure this would resonate with you as well, just, you know, the way you followed the sport. Just I feel like the name Yamamoto really has that connectivity to the New Year's Eve cards with like past bouts against Masato and Istvan Majoros for Kid Yamamoto obviously being so huge and this being Miyu's retirement fight and Saika obviously representing like that current slash future wave being that she's the super atom weight lineal and grand prix champion so like what are your thoughts on that fight it seems like there's a lot of compelling machinations to that matchup for me well it's, it's a difficult one for me i'm not gonna lie to you this is not a fight that i mean there's very rare fights that i wish i didn't have to call right i don't like calling retirement fights uh and, and yamamoto being a friend uh obviously being a canadian she lived in toronto for the longest time um you know, there, there, there's a sentiment with her that I've, I've always kind of like, you know, I, I just wish she could retire at the highest level. But man, is she going to have her hands full with Izawa? Like, Izawa, to me, is the best fighter in Rising. Right? She, pound for pound, is just an absolute monster when she gets into the ring. She will finish you in a heartbeat. She's just got this ability to, to continue to find ways to emerge victorious. Uh, I think Miyu's going to have her hands full. She just can't let Seika come near her, right? And But the problem is, is Yamamoto's a wrestler, so she wants that takedown. So can she pull off uh, a victory in this one here, you know, retire with a 7-7 seven and seven record uh, at 500 uh, against an absolute emerging superstar in the sport, Inizawa, who is just unbelievable as a mixed martial artist. I mean, her submission game is second to none. She is absolutely incredible. She'll find a way to, from a ninja choke, triangle choke, arm bars, front chokes. I mean, she she wins by a ground and pound if she has to. She's absolutely incredible. She grabs your leg, she'll put you in a heel hook. You know, she did that against Nagano, you know, way back when at Deep Deep Jewels 34. So uh, it's it's, it's a challenging vote for me to call. Uh, My heart will always remain with Miyu. But, you know, my brain says, you know, I was going to pull this off because she's absolutely incredible. Again, Dylan, and you've heard me say it a million times over the years, a fight's a fight. Anything can happen. But, you know, it's, it's going to be a challenging one for me to call. Uh, but, yeah, I'll just, uh, you know, I'll sit my, uh, my espresso while I'm calling the, the fight and just kind of smile and see where it goes. Yeah, it's just so many different journeys on this card, too. Like, I, I know I referenced the Sakaki Bara chat a bit ago, but he was kind of talking about just how many different stories there are in the sense of like for some fighters on this card it's their you know swan song kind of outing but then you look at like you know say tension's brother ryujin nasukawa readying for his mma debut so just so many different stories you know ending beginning etc yeah it's, it's, that's the beautiful part of all this right like i mean yeah he's taking on ota right um it, it's was it was an ota yeah it's ota right um it's it's one of those things where the storylines and just the, the pageantry of Japanese MMA and Ryzen MMA is so beautiful. I mean, if, if anyone's never seen the Ryzen Confession series, my goodness, it's, it's such high quality production. You learn so much about each event and each fighter competing on the card that there's so much there that you can learn from and understand heading into the event. And I, I got to tell you, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Every single one of these boats is going to be absolutely insane, to be honest with you, because it is New Year's Eve. Sorry, Natsukawa was fighting uh, Minshin, if I'm not mistaken, right? It's the opening boat of the evening? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, yeah I'm getting updates as we fly here, as, uh, as we go here. So, um, he's Tenshin's brother. Is, is he carrying that, that weight of his brother's legacy on him? Like, a, the, the, his brother's an absolute superstar, right? So, how will he deal with it? Because you always have to look at those types of... of, of athletes and say you know what i need to separate myself from my from my brother my sister my dad whoever it might be and I, i've got to start now right so i'm looking forward to seeing how he's going to perform i think he'll be absolutely fantastic especially when you have your brother as tension so yeah it's going to be absolutely crazy uh, to see how it unfolds um he's fighting in his home territory obviously a south korean is coming in uh, to japan considered hostile territory for them so we'll see how he deals with it. and the crowd's going to be absolutely electric right especially if they see tension right off the bat it's going to be crazy 
and we have mentioned it a few times throughout this chat like there really is something about the new year's eve cards like i was seeing a quote on the ryzen ff english twitter account the other day from yuki matoya where he was saying because it's new year's eve i'm aiming to get a finish i mean i'm sure these guys want to have exemplary performances and big finishes at any event really anytime they'd want to get out there but i guess i'm curious from your perspective can you glean from these fighters that there very much is almost like a difference in their i guess cadence or body language or how they describe talking about being on these new year's eve cards because it seems like a lot of the fighters almost look at it very differently and understandably hold it in that higher kind of esteem oh 100 no ifs ands or buts every single fighter in japan does whatever they can to get onto a New Year's Eve card. They build, they use the, the, the fights from the, from the beginning of the year, first, second, and third quarter, in that sense, to get victories to prove to the rising promoters and the, and the matchmakers that, hey, you know what, I deserve a spot on the, on the New Year's Eve show, namely because it's so massive in Japan. I mean, for those that don't know, it's akin to, you know, what, what we, what we see here in North America on the Super Bowl evenings, right? Like Super Bowl is the highest rated, uh, television viewing experience of the year. Well, in Japan, that happens to be New Year's Eve. So that's why they want to get on there because the eyeballs on them as they compete are absolutely massive. So they want to put on a great performance because then they can ride that throughout the year, uh, with their social media, with their YouTube channels, with whatnot. And of course, getting bigger bouts as they go on because New Year's Eve, it's, you know, it's crazy. It sounds it happens once a year, but for them, it is their Super Bowl evening. So heading into the ring, there's a lot of pressure, right? But at the same time, they know if they perform and they perform well, it bodes massively for the, either their career, whether they're up, an up and comer, uh, whether they're in their prime or for their legacy, because people do not forget what happened on New Year's Eve in Japan. Yeah, and I just love how collaborative Ryzen is. Like, they truly live up to just really the namesake with it being a true fighting federation. I mean, just with reigning Shudo, strawweight, and flyweight champion Joe Arai ready to fight Hiroya Kondo on the card. I mean, just really seems like there's that, I guess, openness to collaborating and supporting a lot of other adjacent leagues, or just leagues over there in general, just in the sense of, like, Shudo, Deep, Pancrase. Like, it seems like there's really a lot of support and yeah love to see that if like that collective kind of mentality really lifts everyone up and everything well yeah i mean why not right like they, they, this, they, these cards the shooto the pancreases and, and whatnot deep jewels right there you know people can say what they want but they're in essence they're almost theater systems right so you build your career on these promotions you know whether it's considered grassroots or whatever it might be to eventually get to the big show and then when the big show thanks you then that, that smaller, quote-unquote, smaller promotion now gets more eyeballs on them. So overall, it just helps the game. It helps the, the mixed martial arts scene in Japan. Uh, it takes it to a whole new level, whereas, you know, here in North America, they're always hiding it. You know, they don't talk as much as, you know, where the promoter came or where the fighter came from or who were this or that. You, you watch a, um, a Ryzen show, they've got the promoter of Shuto and or shootboxing and or whatever, Pancrase. They're there, right? They're ringside. They're there. They're, front row seats getting you know props they're getting you know just they're, they're getting eyeballs on them so it's an overall building of the scene which is absolutely fantastic yeah no doubt love to see it and i mean i guess kind of going back in a way to like that prior point i was talking about with how ryzen seems to marry like great elements of the past but in a very forward thinking kind of way as well like i mean you sort of see that with sidario in a sense just because there's been that new year's eve tradition over the years where sumo wrestlers really just capture the public attention like aki bono versus bob sap was obviously such a massive fight for when it went down but i mean a guy like sidario just really showing that like and not in a way towards aki bono obviously but a pronounced fluidity and evolution and i guess the fluidity of that mma sort of game so i guess can you kind of talk about that a bit just like that new generation of sumo almost because i feel like sidario is one of the more underrated heavyweight prospects in the world for sure yeah there's some good talent in the heavyweight division in japan right and then as funny as it sounds for whenever we see heavyweight boats taking place on a rising cart it's a break for damien and i right because a very good chance it's going to be a one-rounder right <laughs> yeah. and it just it, it flies right through right it's when that heavyweight fight goes into the third round we're like really guys really right but it's a fight you never know what's going to happen so yeah the whole sumo tradition sumo is absolutely massive in japan like it is huge that if they can get a prominent sumo wrestler uh to make their way into mixed martial arts ryzen will try and do the best they can to to scoop the party up and get them to compete on the card so uh it, it is sort of almost a throwback but a, a thank you uh 
uh, over to the sumo generations, right? So I think it's fantastic. And, you know, we start seeing these big dudes be able to throw bombs and, uh, you know, keep their cardio going. It's, it's so much fun to watch. It's so much fun to call. Yeah, and I guess also that lineage sort of thing that I'm talking about kind of is rooted in the fact Ensign, in a way, is a big mentor for Sidario as well. So that's a cool component also, I think. No, oh, Ensign is just a man. That guy saved me so many times in Japan, I can't even tell you. He's an absolute gem. Uh, and when you see him, I'm not going to lie to you, every time I see him, my, the veins, the blood of my veins start getting all pumped up. He makes me excited. His presence alone makes me excited when, when, when Frank Trigg and I were calling the fights in Japan uh, and Ensign would make his way over to the broadcast table it, it was like everything stood still I mean so yeah Sudaria has a great mentor um, in Ensign and listen in a way no joke is he's a well well liked figure in Japan but you know when, when, when that guy's in your corner you have no choice but to perform yeah, I always thought it was cool how he was, like, such a big part of that, you know, lineal UFC title of history, just, like, when Randy Couture was the reigning champion and left, and then Ensign beat him, and it kind of, you know, the lineage of the belt carried through pride, so I guess a bit of a history nerd kind of perspective, but I also like that part of it, too, kind of tying into the Japan scene, too, I guess. Yeah, of course, I mean, anything, when you go back in the day, because remember, pride was bigger than the UFC. Oh, yeah. right? Pride was much bigger than the UFC. Many people don't know that. Those that have never heard of Pride or forgotten about Pride, it was much grander. It was much larger than the UFC at the time before the UFC eventually bought them. Right? So a lot of fighters are kind of making their way back and forth. You know, about Boss Rutten uh, did it. Uh, guys were making like Mark Coleman made his way over. Mark Kerr. Like, oh, there was a lot of guys going back and forth. Oleg like, Tarov, right? There was a whole bunch of different fighters going back and forth. They'd rather be competing in Pride because Pride is paying more money than what the, than, uh, what the UFC was. So, yeah, there's a lot of storylines that have intertwined over the decades um, with the UFC and Pride and just now Pride and Horizon and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, you talk about being an MMA nerd. I mean, this is my 23rd year, if I'm not mistaken, uh, that I've been involved with the sport and going back even training before that in the early 90s. So, um, yeah, people laugh at me sometimes. I've forgotten more than most people know. Like, it's just there's so <laughs> yeah. many things that I look around and I'm like, well, yeah. I, 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 I tell a funny story one time uh, when I was working at Sportsnet at the time when I had UFC Central on the air, uh, and we had just f- finished recording the show, and this Dylan is no joke. I remember walking by, and there was an intern who had, they all had TV screens on their desks, and they could watch whatever they wanted, and he was watching, um, you know, some sort of a, a, a replay show of the UFC events, and um, it was, I think it was Josh Koch against Tiago, somebody, I don't know who it was, and I stopped and, and watched the fight, and, and my producer came around me, he's like, oh yeah, remember when we were at that event, and we called that fight, and I was like, like, I literally forgot. <laughs> like, I just, there's so many bouts that I've seen and been around and interviewed and, and, and just whatever it covered, called, that I, even I forget. There's just so much. I, I think that the, the folders and the, the, the memory banks in my head are almost completely full and overflowing now. I just forget what I've seen, what I've called. And there's just so much. But there are certain items that stand out. Um, and Ensign in a way is one of those guys and you know the radical tours of the world who guys who always gave me the time of day no matter what city or country we were in uh, just wonderful human beings I know the game has changed I know that the uh, the, the, the attitude amongst fighters and the media uh, or just in general has completely changed um, but it is what it is and, and, and you know, I, I hold a high regard for so many different um, you know fighters, managers and, and, and promoters in general over the years that, that I've been involved with the sport so yeah, no, I mean, it comes across well, and definitely, that was why I wanted to have you on to talk a little bit about the history and just, you know, what's going on with Ryzen now, presently, and going forward. But yeah, I do want to be mindful of your time as well, man. I'm sure I could ask you questions for hours, realistically, but I want to be respectful of your time and schedule, so just giving you the floor a little bit here. Is there any final parting thought you'd want to add as we're wrapping up here, Joe? Uh, listen, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for reaching out. Anything I can do to, to, to talk MMA and, and rise in is obviously a great time. Uh, I just know that this card is going to be absolutely fantastic. Uh, I, I kind of people always laugh when I post a picture right before the event. I've got this massive Dylan, absolutely massive espresso maker that I, I drink <laughs> the whole thing uh, throughout the evening. Uh, by the time I, we go live on the air, I think our sound checks generally one hour before the show. We make sure the video and the audio is a okay, and that's when I start sipping. And by the time we go live, I guess midnight or one a.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, I'm wired. I'm wired because I know I've got eight hours of fights to call, and you've got to be on point because um, it can get you know, when you're sitting in a room 
uh, at home alone, not alone, obviously my, my family is sleeping in the other rooms, but I'm like, I got to keep, I got to act like I'm in the venue and the, the yeah. sound quality and the video quality that we get from the arena is so pristine. I feel like I'm there. I tell Damien all the time, we got to act like we're there, keep the energy up. Uh, you know, there, there's no such thing as yawning. There's no such thing as, yeah, we get our bathroom breaks really quickly, but we have to act like we are there because we're not being flown over there at the time. Right. But when you're there, man, I gotta tell you, it's, it's, it is not, it's just incredible. It's when you are a live event in Japan, it's, it's something else, man. If you've never been, you gotta go. If anyone listening to this or you gotta go, it's unbelievable. It's, 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 it's crazy. This Saitama Super Arena and, and the nostalgia that you feel when you go out there. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely on my bucket list. Definitely got to go out there and take in one of these amazing shows. But very excited for Ryzen 45 and the next chapter in this grander story of combat sports in Japan unfurling. And yeah, just really appreciate you making the time, man. Excited to see the event overall. And just until then, you have a good you know holiday season and everything, man. And it was good catching up a bit. The pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on.